to Katrina's Creations. This is episode 38. If you are brand new to the podcast and this is your first time, thank you so much for stopping by. If you enjoy it, don't forget to click the little red subscription button and that will let you know um, whenever I post, which is usually on Saturdays. If you have been watching me or are a returning subscriber, thank you for coming back despite all my my mess ups on my videos. So um, thanks for putting up with me and coming back again each week to watch. So this week I'm doing things a little backwards. Normally I show my finished objects, but I'm going to start with my works in progress so it can segue a little bit into the knit along which ends this week. So I finished my banner unfurled, which I'll show you in a few minutes, which is for the knit along. So when I went to knit night this week, I didn't want to take anything overly complicated and I needed something with a little bit bigger needles because my hands were killing me. So um, I took, this is the bag I took. This is a Stitch and You bag that I won on the Yarn and You Girl podcast. It's for her 600 subscriber giveaway. And it's really cute. It has, the inside has like little blue flowers. And it has a smell good inside. It's lavender smells so nice. Every time I open it up, it makes everything inside smell wonderful. It's like I could stick my head in the bag, but that would be a little funny looking. I walked around with, head on, with my, my head inside my, my project bag the whole time. But it smells so good. Anyway, I've been working on socks. I am doing the... Oh, I did that and got fuzz in my, in my nose. There's a good reason why I shouldn't walk around with a project bag on my head. Um, this is the blueberry waffle sock. And I am not making a full-size sock. I don't wear full-size socks. I tend to wear the little footsie socks that are nice and comfortable on my little feet. And I do have little feet. It's one of the few little parts about me that I've got little feet. So this is all the further I've gotten on it. It's just the cuff. And I'm separating for the heel. Because like I said, these are just the little, little footsie socks. And the yarn that I am using is Crofter DK. Like I said, I wanted to um, knit something with a little bit bigger needle, and these are, I believe, 3.75 millimeters. And these are nine, uh, nine and a half inch chai gu, or chow gu, chai gu, whatever. Um, I didn't know if I would like knitting on nine inch needles. I thought it would feel awkward because you kind of are holding them like this, but it actually doesn't. It feels pretty normal, and it really goes fast. Um, but this, this. Um, is sold by Sirdar, and it is called Fair Isle Effect DK. It is 60% acrylic, 25% nylon, 15% wool. So I thought they'd make nice, cozy, fuzzy, like slipper socks. So again, that is the yarn that I'm using. And I haven't gotten overly far into it. Um, like I said, I'm just starting to work on the heel here. I don't make socks all that often. If I do, they're usually footsie socks because that's all I wear. So that is my work in progress, and I've only been working on that a, about a day, just during knit night, so just a couple hours. So now I will work on my, I will show you my finished object. I was bound and determined I was going to finish the Banner Unfurled Shawl because it really drives me crazy when you watch uh, people who do knit-alongs and then they don't finish the project, and they're the ones that, started the knit along so I was determined I was going to do this um, as I've mentioned on the other episodes the pattern itself is knit in sport weight or sock weight yarn this is much smaller because it, it's only about maybe 10 inches deep because this is knit on lace weight I did not follow the stitch count I followed gauge count for this so I basically measured it against um, another shawl that I made of the same pattern that I made in fingering weight. So altogether I've made this pattern in what I designed it in, which is the sport weight, but I've also made it in fingering weight and lace weight. Um, the lace weight I would never ever do again. It took me forever. I think I've worked on this between a month and a half and two months and got tendonitis from doing it because I had to use like size two needles. And by the time I finished, I think the original pattern, you have a little over 100 stitches, maybe 111, 120. 
I had over 230 stitches by the time I finished this to go all the way across. So, but it is finished. So I'm going to show you the whole thing. It begins at this side. I have not woven the ends in yet all the way across because it literally just finished blocking this morning. I blocked it last night and that's when it dried. So I, I got all the beads in this week. I have a stitch, a progress keeper in here somewhere. Must be on the other side. So here's where the peak of it is. And then it comes across. Yeah, here's my progress keeper. This is where I was last week. So I did all of this, but like I said, it's over 200 stitches all the way across. Plus putting, I had to reconfigure all the beads because of course the stitch count's different. So that meant all the bead count was different too. I did change something with the Pico edging. It has a Pico bind off. Um, technically following the pattern, it should have fallen that it would have been in the white. But I thought that I had, the white was so, so um, like bold, kind of in your face compared to the blue, that I just was afraid it would be too much white. So I went ahead and I liked the blue and the blue was the more expensive of the yarns. So I wanted to make sure I tried to use a lot of it. So I did my Pico bind off and you can see it here. It almost ruffled because it's so, it's such a, um, a thin yarn because it's lace weight that by the time you put the bind off, it actually curls. It looks all like roughly. I mean, I'm happy with it, but it took forever. I spent maybe five hours doing nothing but the bind off. Yeah. It took a long time to do that many stitches. So, um, it is finished for the knit along and this is going to my daughter-in-law. I'm just going to put it on shortly just so you can kind of see what it looks like. That's what it looks like when it's done. So, but this is going to my daughter-in-law Renee and she does watch the podcast. So just pretend you didn't see it. Act surprised at Christmas time. So anyway, it's finished. I just have to go back and weave the ends in. So that one, and it is very soft and it's very, very lightweight. I mean, you could wear this in the summertime. It is wool, but it is so light that you could get away with wearing this in the summertime with no problem. It really wouldn't. It's not as heavy as, as the other ones because it, like I said, it's a lighter weight yarn. So as I said before, the knit along is finishing. It actually ends tomorrow, uh, July 30th. And in order to enter, if you're finishing it up, get it, get your entry in, you need to join my Ravelry group um, and post in the, the Katrina's Creations Ravelry group a picture of your finished project and tell me what kind of yarn you used. We have four entries so far, and I know there's another lady that finished hers, but I don't know if she'll get it posted into Ravelry in time. Um, so... Yeah, if you can get them in there, get them in so you so you are entered in the drawing. I will be using random.org to draw, and the video will go up Monday morning as far as who won, and I'll give you the information Monday morning when it come, when it comes up as far as how to get in touch with me. The prize again is the project bag with the stitch markers and the progress keeper and the skein of Primrose yarn. We could all say this together by now because I announced this like I don't know how many times. So, yes. So this is the last time you'll have to actually listen to me tell you what you're going to win. So that being said, I should have been working on baby clothes this week. Nobody in my family is pregnant. So that's not that that wouldn't be a good thing, but nobody in my family is pregnant. But we have four girls at our church that are all expecting. I'm glad it's not contagious. Um, but anyway, we're having a baby shower for one of them tomorrow night, and I've got all that baby yarn that somebody gave me, but I was so busy working on the banner unfurl that I never got it finished, so I had to cheat and go buy a gift. Um, yeah, so normally I try to knit like a little baby sweater or something for everybody's firstborn baby that has a baby at church. I didn't get to it this time, so, oh well, my bad. I'll have to work on that one. So, um, 
you know, it's, it's funny when, when I went through the change of life about five years ago, I started through it at about 46, 47. My husband got worried that maybe I was pregnant and that's why things weren't happening. So he suggested I go buy a pregnancy test. I don't think I've ever told you guys this story, but if I have, just bear with me or just slip ahead. But anyway, he, he wanted me to take a pregnancy test to make sure that I really was not pregnant. So I went to the dollar store because I thought I am not spending a small fortune on a pregnancy test. I've never used one in my life. I don't even know how to take a pregnancy test. So I go to the dollar store and I'm looking for one. I was not, there was no way I was going to ask somebody where their pregnancy test was. You know, old lady, gray hair, not asking where a pregnancy test is. So I get in line and I find it right at the cashier's. Yeah, of course, right at the cashier's. The lady looks at the pregnancy test, looks at me and goes, oh, is this for you? And I'm like, I sincerely hope not. So she says, well, you know, and there's this whole line of people standing behind me. Of course, you know, it couldn't be like just her and me having this conversation. No, she's discussing my biological clock with everybody who's standing in line going, you know, there was a lady who came in here a few years ago and she had twins. She says, you'll have to come back and let me know how that works out. I was like, yeah, I'm going to do that. You're a total stranger. I'm not going to come back and tell you how things worked out. Anyway, I get back home and I, I go into the bathroom and my husband's standing outside the door and I'm doing the test and he's like, what's it say? What's it say? I said, I, I think it's a negative. The door opens up and he hands me a telephone and says, call your daughter. If anybody knows, she does. My daughter has seven children. At that time, I think she had like four or five. So she he hands the phone back into me and he goes, call your daughter and ask her. So I get on the phone with my daughter. And she goes, I'm explaining to her what's happening. She says, let me stop laughing first. She says, would that be funny? I said, that would not be funny. So she says, okay, mom, if it's negative, it's negative. You have nothing to worry about. I said, okay, well, that's a good thing. So she says, oh, now Dan's laughing. That would be my son-in-law. She says, yeah, you know, it's been the family joke ever since. So, yeah, but I was definitely not pregnant. So that was a good thing. That would be like a shock at this point. So grandchildren are a lot more fun. Not that I didn't enjoy being a parent, but grandparenting is so much more fun. Which reminds me, next Saturday, my my son and my daughter-in-law are coming in with the four four of my eleven grandchildren. Uh, they are going to be coming in this Monday. So next week's podcast, there will be one, and I am going to be talking about yarn shops. I'm actually recording it today because they'll still be here, and the room that they stay in is the room that is my craft room and where I record the videos. So I'm actually recording it ahead of time, uh, but it is going to be a trip itinerary of where we're going on our vacation and the yarn shops I'm going to hit, what I'm looking for in the yarn shops, and it's also going to be like tips and tricks for going on a budget on your vacation. So I'm going to kind of show you. I used to I used to have a an organizational blog because I like to organize things. So I like to plan things out and I mean I plan things to the minute. I tend to be very organized that way. So I enjoy planning our vacations and so I'm going to share some of how I do that and how I save money and how to check to find out decent hotels at really good prices. So if you're interested in that, make sure to stop by next Saturday because that's when it's going to post, even though I'm recording it today. So there still will be something to watch next Saturday. Um, so on to my new craft. I was watching, there is a, a series on YouTube. It was on it's on British TV, I think BBC maybe, or I don't know what their channels are like over there, but there's a TV show called Escape to the Country. It's kind of like House Hunters, but English version of House Hunters. And they go to these, I mean, like here in the U.S., a, a house that's considered old is 100 years old. Over there, it's like they're showing cottages that were built in the 15 and 1600s, and they've got all these gorgeous beams, and it's out, you know, the beautiful countryside. I mean, it, it's gorgeous. I like looking at it just for the views. It's just really pretty. So anyway, on the show, there was this family and they were looking at houses in the area of Dorset. So 
as part of the program, they take the couple that's looking for a house to a um, to some kind of interest that's in that area, something it's known for, like, you know, if it's an apple area, they, they talk about, you know, making apple cider or apple juice or, you know, they do different things like that, like little field trips and they follow it. So when they did Dorset, they talked about the Dorset button industry. I had never heard of it before. So I had to Google and find out what Dorset buttons were. And then I discovered a brand new craft and I'm having fun with it. So let me show you my Dorset buttons. This was my first attempt. It's kind of getting blown out. There you go. It is rings and then you weave thread around it. This was my attempt at a tree. It doesn't look anything like a tree. I'm not sure what it looks like, but it's, if I stick little French knots along here, I think it'll look like a little bouquet. If you Google Dorset buttons, you can see some gorgeous ones. Um, some people have actually attached, they make them in different sizes, like really big ones and little small ones, and they attach pins to the back of them and use them for brooches or pieces for your hair. Um, I saw one where they had taken like a group of them that were all different sizes and like sewed them together and then they attached chains to them and they used them as a necklace. It was really cool. I saw some as earrings. So Google Dorset buttons and you'll see all, you'll see a lot better attempts at it than what I have produced. So um, here was one I experimented with doing with beads. It's still picking up. There we go. So it's got little beads in the center, little beads all the way around the outside. And then this is one, this is the last one that I made. It's in autumn colors. It's, it's looking very orangey, but it's really not. That's kind of a burnt orange color. So I'm going to tell you the history of Dorset buttons. And then I did a little tutorial. Mine is not in any way as good as some of the ones out on YouTube. If you just go on you if you just go on YouTube and Google Dorset button making, you'll see much better tutorials than what I did because my camera just doesn't pick up as detailed. It, it doesn't do close up very well. So um but I am going to show my tutorial, but I wanted to tell you the history of Dorset buttons first. So and I will put the links where I got the information about it, I will put the links in a little in a little down bar or in the description box. I'll put it someplace so you can look them up for yourself. But back in 1618, in the Dorset Cotswold area, there was a man who was named Abraham Case. And Abraham Case, when he was off to war, he saw a lot of the uniform buttons were coming off of the officers and off of their uniforms. So men were creating buttons for the uniforms by twisting fabric around a frame or a ring or something like that in order to create a button so that it worked. Okay, that is one story of how they got started. Another story says that he was influenced by the Brussels lace that he saw. Um, so I'm not sure which story is right. But in 1622, he married and he and his wife settled in a town near Shaftesbury, which I have no clue where that's at, but it's somewhere in Dorset. Um, and he started the Dorset Button Company based on the ideas that he had gotten from when he was a soldier. So the buttons were made originally, they did not originally look like these. They originally were made from sheep's horn and fabric and thread. And uh, of course, Cotswold has lots of sheep, so that was in abundance. So they were called high tops. In other words, how these buttons are flat, the buttons in it, you can see some of the high top buttons um, when you look on if you just Google the Dorset buttons, some of them, they almost kind of look like a little bunt cake is what my granddaughter and I looked at and we both said, it's like a little mini bunt cake because they actually kind of puff up over it. They stick out, they're three-dimensional, they're not flat. Uh, but those were called high top or button or Dorset knobs. And they do kind of look like a, like a doorknob. And uh, they were kind of conical shaped and they were the, they were first. Then the flat buttons came later. And it was a cottage industry, so a lot of people in the neighborhood were making them, you know, in their cottages in the evening and supporting themselves by this. But in 1699, there was a law passed that, and I'm going to read to quote it, it said, 
uh, preventing the making or selling of buttons made of cloth, serge, drugget, I don't know what that is, or other stuffs. This actual law effect remained in effect for 200 years until 1899. Nobody really paid much attention to it because apparently buttons continue to be made, so they pretty much ignored it because it affected thousands of people. Uh, buttons were continuing to be made despite the law. So in 1730, the grandson of Abraham Case took over the company, and at that time, instead of using um, whatever they were using as a frame, which I think was made from the sheep horn, they started using metal rings. And the metal rings were actually um, imported from the Midlands of England. The wire was that it was made. And children actually would twist the, um, the, twist the wire for it. And the children that twisted it were called twisters. There were solderers who would solder the ring together. They were called dippers. And then there were stringers who would string the rings together to um, be sold as, you know, like groups. Like they would put them maybe in groups of 20, groups of, they would string them together. So that was how they were shipped to the distributors. So it was, a, it was an industry at that point. It branched out to quite a few towns. Um, when they first got started, um, there was a man named John Clayton who Peter Case or had to organize the workers at home. And at that time, there were 700 women in the area that were making buttons. By the end of the 1700s, there were over 4,000. So this was a massive production. There were factories or called depots that were opened up all over the UK. Uh, William Hillier Case was the last of the, of the Case family uh, of the button industry. He died in 1912, and the Case, the family money that the Case had, apparently there is some famous streets in Liverpool called Case's Street and Clayton Square. Those were named by for the Case family. Um, so that part was interesting, but it's somewhere in Liber Liverpool, so... I don't know. I've never been outside of the United States, but I'll have to Google it and like look at it and see what happens. Um, I use Google Maps all the time. I live vicariously through Google Maps, going through the street view and looking at things. So, Anyway, button-making machines were invented between 1820 and 1844. So by that time, the button industry had kind of hit its peak as far as a cottage industry, so it started dying out after that. Uh, button making by hand declined, and this year uh, the, the United Kingdom declared Dorset button making a heritage craft. It was an endangered heritage craft, and this was declared by the Heritage Craft Association. So, all the more reason to learn how to make Dorset buttons, because apparently it is considered an endangered heritage craft. So, that's why I started experimenting, because I just thought it would look fun, and I was like, you know, if you want to attach unique buttons to your shawls or, or your sweaters and things, this might be a way to do it. So, I'm going to insert, insert the tutorial now. Marker ...that I got at Joann's. I think I used a coupon for it. It is one inch from the outer diameter. I have an embroidery needle, you know, the larger ones, and I've looped my thread so that the end of the thread is the loop, and I threaded the two ends through the needle. So that way when I loop it through it will form, um, I don't need a knot, I will just like put a slip through the, the loop. So you go down through the hole, and then I just go up through my loop right here. Oops, took it with me. And there you can see I've got it secured. Now you're going to do a blanket stitch. And a blanket stitch, you're going to go down through the hole. And then you'll have this 
the, yarn, the thread that you're pulling through, you're going to come up through it. This is called a blanket stitch. So you can see a little bit there. It forms like a little, little catch at the top here. So I'll do that again. You go down through the hole. And come up through the loop that you've created. There you can see me coming back up through the loop and it catches the yarn. And now I've got two stitches. You're going to do this all the way around the loop. So I'm going to work a little faster now and show you what it looks like when it's done. Down through the loop, up through the, the loop that I've created. Down through the hole and back up through the loop. And you want to keep kind of sliding these stitches along here tightly together. And you keep the little ridge that it forms up at the top. Okay? I will finish this section and I'll show you the next. All right, as you can see, I have finished. I have a little strand here, but don't worry about that. That will get incorporated into, you just weave it into the center section. So what you're going to do now is take your next color. I've chosen orange because I'm doing this in um, all autumn colors. So again, I have put, this is the cut section of the thread. And I've put the two ends of the cut section through the needle so that I have a loop at the end. So once I thread the needle through here, I will not have a knot. And I'm going to go down through the hole again. And I'm going to pick up the loop. Just go through it. You can see I've pulled it. Make sure you pull it snug. And then I'm going to wrap this thread around the ring to form um, spokes, like bicycle spokes. So you're going to put it around and then you rotate just slightly to the side. You want to have about eight spokes. Let them crisscross in the middle and come around. Every time it crosses the top, the back will not look the same. You want the spokes to look right on the front. So you're going to go across and rotate it and then go across and rotate it. And I've got it caught on something. Okay, there you can see I have eight spokes. The back is a mess. Just ignore the back. It'll end up looking straight once you get everything woven in. So now you're going to come up through the back and you're going to go in one spoke and then you'll go across to the spoke right across. So you're going to come up through one and down through the other. You're basically forming the hub of your wheel. And this is going to hold all of your uh, spokes in place, but you want to do it tightly. So I'm going to come up through the center and you try to tie in these back spokes kind of uniformly as you go. Like I said, they're not as neatly as neat looking as the front, but they will be once you finish. So you're just going to rotate your way around the ring, going up through one spoke and down through the spoke directly across from it until you've gone all the way around.
And don't worry if your hub is not exactly in the center because as you weave around, it kind of straightens itself out. So here's what it looks like now. And my thread is in the back. And now I'm going to start with the same orange. Um, and I'm going to, you're just going to weave up and down all the way around in a circle. So it's just going to be under and over up through a spoke, down through a spoke, and go all the way around. Okay, now your second time around, because your spokes are even um, and you want your next row to be the, all, the opposite of what you did before, so in other words, if you went over a spoke, the next time you come around you want to go under that spoke, so you do have to skip a spoke at, uh, at one point in order to make it work that way. So, and I do that from the underside so it doesn't show as much because the back of the button nobody's going to see. Okay, I've gone all the way around. So now I'm going to skip a spoke and then I'm going to come up and go around. So that if I went over a spoke, this time I'm going under the spoke. You can see uh, the weave pattern starting to form. And I'm going to change colors at this point. Okay, I've changed to green. And again, I've threaded my needle the same way that I did before. I'm going to come up through the back of one of the spokes, up through the back go down and again I'm going to pick up that loop just so I don't have a knot and then I'm going to continue weaving all the way around just like I did with the orange You can see I've gone all the way around and now I'm going to do the opposite. This spoke here I went under, I'm now going to go over so I'll have to, to skip a spoke in order to do that. If you hear barking, that's my neighbor's dog. 
He barks every time he comes outside. Okay, I've gone around twice. And here's what it looks like. It still looks slightly off center, but it will kind of adjust itself as you go. And you can always go kind of just go back and forth like you would short rows to fill in the difference. So I'm going to do a, a few more rows of this green and then I'll come back and do a final color. Okay, my last color is a dark kind of an umber or a burnt orange and I've attached it the same way I have with the other ones. Um, now the back where you've got all these little threads, I just hold them alongside the back of a spoke so that as I'm weaving over and under, they actually get caught up and woven in. And then at the end, I just trim them because this is the back of the button. It doesn't need to look as neat because nobody's going to see it anyway. But here's what the front of the button looks like so far. So we have yellow and then I have orange and green. And now I'm going to have a dark orange on the side. So again, I'm just going to do the same under and over, under and over method that I did. I started with an over. So it goes under and over, and I'm going to do a few rows of that just to finish the button off. So this is a simple button, and it's only taken me maybe 10 minutes to make, maybe less. So the more intricate ones, the ones that I made with the beads, that took longer because I had to think about what I was doing because um, I had never made one before. And the first time I did one of these, it took a while. But once I caught on to it, it goes pretty quick. So you can make these buttons relatively fast. You could sit down and, and make maybe maybe six of them in a little over an hour. So we're almost done, and I'll show you what it looks like when we're finished. We're finished. Oops. Yeah. Here we have our finished dorset button. This is the back. It's not as neat. Uh, you can take and use your needle and kind of thread through the back. Like I said, it's the back of a button. No one's going to notice that. So if you mess it up, it's not a big deal. Um, so you could do these in any colors. This one, I can't get it too close, it gets too blurry. My camera is not the greatest for, for tiny work like this. And that's kind of what it looks like straight across. It's pretty flat. So there is my button tutorial. Okay. The last thing I wanted to tell you about those buttons were that they were, when they were produced at home, they were graded by their quality. If they were the finest export quality, they were put on, you know how when you buy, buy uh, buttons in like Joann's or in a, in a sewing store, they're on a little piece of cardboard. Okay, the cardboard was in different colors and the different colors determined what quality the buttons were. So if they were on pink cards, they were the finest buttons. If they were on dark blue button or dark blue carding, they were a mid grade and the lowest grade were on a yellow card. And a good buttoner could make 72 buttons in a day and earn three shillings. You saw how long it took me. It takes me about 10. I, you could maybe make six of these in an hour if you got really experienced. So, um, yeah, that's a lot of buttons to be making. At the, at the speed I'm making them at, that would mean I would have to work 12 hours, 12 hours to make 72 buttons. And that's probably about how many hours they were working, to be honest. But they were only earning three shillings a day. So check out Dorset Button Making. And like I said, I will put in, the, in somewhere either either in a little title or a down bar or something, I will put the links of where I read about the history about Dorset buttons. But check them out on YouTube. And yeah, it was interesting and it was fun and it's relatively cheap to do because 
you just are using embroidery floss or the um, the cotton you use for doing doilies you can use either of those you could even use lace weight thread so anything that is is about that thickness you could use any kind of weight um, you wouldn't want to go with like a fingering weight but lace weight yarn you could also use for this so if you're making something in lace weight you could make buttons to exactly match it so that is oh, I have acquisitions I only have a couple acquisitions to show you and that will be the end of our episode for today I've gotten into dishcloths because the projects that I was doing and taking with me other than the socks I'm currently working on my cozy memory blanket is too big for me to be dragging back and forth to work to work on at lunchtime so I've gotten into dish dishcloth making so I bought this I went to I got this at yarn um, at the knitting shop to, this week when I was at knitting night this is knit mania this is all hundred percent cotton uh, this is called Knit Mania. What's the color number? Color. It doesn't say. It just says open end print colors. So, but it's gray and black and white. My mother has a black and white kitchen. Guess what she's getting? Some dishcloths. And then my daughter and my daughter-in-law both have blue in their kitchens. So I bought one dark, two light. So they'll both get some of this color and then I'll make them one each in this color. So yeah, that's going to be my purse knitting this week or whenever just to have with me. So that is the end of this week's uh, podcast. And I hope you come back on Saturday to watch the, the vacation planning. If you enjoyed this video, give me a thumbs up and I'll see you again next week. Thanks a lot. Bye.